In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of His blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory. Hey everyone, welcome back to our Sunday Bible class on songs outside of this Psalter. It's uh, been several months of looking at the poetry of the Old Testament and recognizing how the Jews worshipped God and bringing to light in our last quarter how when we worship God as well through the songs that we sing, we want to recapture the spirit of the worship of the Psalter. And in this quarter, we've taken looking at the songs of praise and prayer outside of the book of Psalms, the Psalter, so that we could reflect a little bit upon how those songs impacted the lives of those people as they're recorded. Of course, the collection of all of these songs in their historical narrative context doesn't mean that when it's written, that's when she wrote or when he wrote this song, but rather the historian places the song at the event of history where this song either was applied or where the songing, the song or the singing of a song had in its, had its original meaning. And so we come to the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, if you'd like to look there in your Bible. And this passage has its roots really in the storyline of the book of Judges, where you're familiar with the refrain repeated often, there was a king, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So Samuel, who becomes... Uh, the important um, character that changes Israel's history where he becomes the one the first of many prophets in the office of prophet for God uh, he becomes the one who inaugurates and um, lays his hands upon the first king that Israel will have and the first king of God's choice for Israel so there, there's an important aspect that Hannah plays in that she brings to fruit this child uh, who will grow up to be Samuel. So when we come to chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, we know, if you don't remember, but let's be reminded about the story of Hannah, a woman who was godly and whose life had been touched by infertility. And her husband, Elkanah, um, took another wife, we presume most, almost certainly because she was unable to conceive. And so uh, by uh, this second wife, Penaniah, 
Um, Elkanah had several children. But it was more than that because she would mock Hannah uh, for her childlessness. So in desperation, Hannah went to the temple and prayed to God, her creator, for a son, promising God, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget your handmaid, but will give to your handmaid a boy, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life, and no razor shall come on his head, she says in chapter 1 and verse 11. So the family returns to their home of Ramah, and the Bible says Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and Yahweh remembered her, and it happened when the time had come that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of Yahweh. So this record of her first prayer was a supplication. And if you remember in the storyline, um, if you go back and read it yourself, Eli notices that while she is praying, her lips move, but there is no sound. And so that means that she was praying in her mind and, and she was uh, um, silently speaking the words, but there was no sound coming out of her mouth. And that unmuttered or unexpressed um, speech, clearly the Bible teaches God heard. And so that's an important aspect about prayer that we should reflect upon. And I've often made a point, and I think it's rightly so, that we need to vocalize our thoughts to God. We need to speak to God and use our mouth, use our voice and speak to God. Because, uh, at least in my own experience, it's often when we try to mutter them or, or silently pray them that we often get lost in our thought and never complete our thought to God. Um, but if you're engaging in conversation, you're speaking then you're able to finish thoughts, you hear what you're saying, and you're able to finish them. It's harder to go to sleep while you're talking <laughs> than it is while you're sleeping. So her prayer was peculiar that way, that it was silent, it was unmuttered or unspoken, and but yet it's validated because she's heard. And so in her protest, um, to Eli, who accuses her of being drunk, she says she's never taken any strong drink, and she pled with Eli with her uh, need and desire for a child, and he says to her, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition that you have asked of him, end quote. So Eli, after hearing her petition, that she had made to God when she spoke it to Eli, Eli said, okay, God's going to answer your prayer. Maybe God spoke it to Eli in that moment. Maybe Eli spoke it by faith. Um, it's uncertain how Eli knew for certain, except that he was God's representative uh, as this priest. But the answer is made and God grants them a child, and Hannah follows through with her uh, promise and, and brings him to um, Eli, and a sacrifice is made. And she says in verse 27 of chapter 1, it's very important words that set the context for the song. Actually, beginning verse 26, I, su I suspect. Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. And for this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I have asked of him. And so I have also dedicated him now to, so I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So she follows through with her promise. When God answers her prayer, 
she she follows through with what she had promised to God. Now we can say much about Hannah in that whole story, but what's significant is that the song of Hannah that follows this event is a song of thanksgiving. It's uh, rendered by many to be one of the more eloquent um, poems about the divine uh, attributes of God's power, his holiness, his knowledge, his, his majesty, and certainly his power. And so this psalm has been categorized by most as a psalm of thanksgiving. And, and you know, when you, you look at this, um, it shows that she was a poetess, but it will also show that she was a prophetess of significance because she knew her desire had been fulfilled. She burst in this song, brings forth gratitude to God for his goodness and her uh, magnificent answer to prayer in this song, very much like what we'll study next week with Mary, the mother of Jesus, there's going to be so much parallel to this song of Hannah, to the song of Mary. But it is significant, and I wanna, I wanna make this observation right off the top, is that Hannah's song is more than just a song of thanksgiving that Samuel has been born. It's a song of thanksgiving for Yahweh, the Holy One. In verse 2 of the song of chapter 2, she'll call him the rock. Verse 3, she'll call God the God of knowledge. She'll call him the one who breaks the bows of the mighty and gives strength to the feeble. Verse 4, the one who gives children to the barren woman. Verse 5, we understand that. The one who kills and makes alive. Verse 6, the one who uh, makes poor and makes rich. Verse 7, the one who raises up the poor out of the dust, verse 8. The one who keeps the feet of his holy ones, verse 9. And breaks those who strive with him, verse 10. And gives strength to his king. And exalts the horn of his anointed, verse 10. It's important that this prayer of thanksgiving describes God as the God of the great renewal and the great reversal. Here is this woman who's not able to have children. She's been mocked and humiliated by her husband's other wife. And now God has answered her prayer. And now she has one child. And this one child she gives back to the Lord. It is a celebration of what God has really accomplished in her. And she doesn't praise God for how beautiful my child is while every mother and every father have said wonderful things about their children, and rightly so, in making prayers of thanksgiving to God. But what her thanksgiving to God was, was not how wonderful Samuel was, but just that Samuel is. And it was because of God. And so the mention at the end in verse 10 of the king and his anointed makes many uh, scholars believe that this song was not original with Hannah, but was added later. And I suppose we could spend a lot of time talking about that aspect, but, but I, I want to make some observations. Number one, that presumes there's no such thing as predictive prophecy in Scripture. And someone can speak prophetically, that is, speaking what will happen in the future as if it is in the present. God does that in his own words, and then prophets do that also. So when God speaks to Adam about the seed of woman, and when God speaks to Abram, promising him a seed, um, those predictive elements of what's being spoken don't become um, invalid because they have yet to come about. And so her description of he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed means that God was speaking through her in this song to foretell exactly the significance of the birth of her son. 
that Samuel would anoint the first king of Israel and the first king of God's choice. Another thing about this song is um, a little bit about the structure of these history books of Samuel. That at the end of 2 Samuel, toward chapter 22 and 23, we find songs of David, the king, that would be appointed by God to be his king. And here at the beginning of Samuel, even though it's not chapter 1, it's chapter 2, is Hannah's song. And some have suggested, perhaps rightly, that these songs bookend the books of First and Second Samuel as reasons for songs of thanksgiving on both ends to quantify that this historical narrative is glorifying God. So when you look at this chapter, um, verses one, uh, chapter 2, we're only going to read the song, verses 1 through 10. You're going to see Hannah's song of thanksgiving to God for in giving her the favor of being the mother to a child. Um, we'll read about um, how God is worthy of such a praise. And I want you to, um, I guess, rather than me tell you, I kind of want you to listen as we read the song and reflect upon in this song of thanksgiving what is it that Hannah's life what in her, Hannah's life was in the forefront of her mind when she said this prayer of thanksgiving there might be aspects about the song that we may not be able to completely connect because her thought may have been taken to another thought that may have not been immediately relevant to what was transpiring in her life. But you'll see, I think, the more that we talk about it, you'll see that connection. So verse 1, chapter 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Notice the first person uh, he's in your salvation. There is no other, there, there is no holy, there is no one holy like the Lord, third person. Indeed, there is no one besides you because um, there is no, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, the, the feeble gird on strength. Those who were well full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven. But she who has many children, languages, the Lord kills and makes alive, brings down to Sheol and raises up. He brings low, he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he set the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Sorry, that was not a very good reading of the song, but I hope you were able to follow. It's noticed, noticeable how she makes contrasts back and forth. Um, the bows of the mighty are shattered, broken, verse 4. But the feeble, they gird on strength. It, it's the, the mighty ones are now fallen, while the weak ones are now made strong. Um, the Lord kills and makes alive. Uh, those who were full hire them out, sells out for bread. And those who were hungry uh, are no longer hunger. Uh, it's She's talking about how God has reversed everything. Because look at her life. Everything has reversed. 
Um, she was married, unable to have a child. Her husband married a second. And I know we could have another discussion about that, but he marries a second and by her has children. And that wife, uh, Peninnah, turns it against Hannah and uh, abuses her. So Hannah struggles and God reverses her struggle. And she has seven, my translation reads. Remember seven, suggesting the idea of fullness doesn't necessarily mean she had six more children. It means that she had all she needed. Here was God's great reversal and she had all that she needed and she gave it back to God. So it's important when you look at a song or a psalm to do the best that we can to understand what the author wanted to say in the choosing of the words. Because we could make anything, I suppose, take someone's words and, and t make it mean whatever we want it to mean. And, and that would be uh, reckless and unjust and dishonest, really, to try to understand. Because we don't want people doing that with our words, so we should try to understand. So when Hannah says, my heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. God, you saved me. She owns her mercy. I mean, I want you to see that very first outcropping of who and what this song is about. When she had received mercy from God, she owned it with thankfulness, and praising him for it. She was not like the nine lepers, if you remember. She was like the one that Jesus prayed, who came back and, and gave back to God. I, I love this line I read somewhere. Praise is our rent. Do God. <laughs> Think about that. Prayer is our rent. Do God. Uh, our li In the life of that we live, our tribute to him. We are unjust if we do not pay it. And so this praise that she offers in prayer is this rightly due payment for the mercy that she's received. Um, we may not always live our life in comfort and, and look at Hannah's life. I don't know how many years she exactly endured being childless and, and then endured the, the horror of being humiliated by uh, uh, Penina. But the mercy that she received, she attributes to God. It was not because uh, she and her husband were able to work it out and have a child. It's because God had made it possible. The Bible never suggests that it was miraculous without the help of her husband. But the point is, in her song, her thanksgiving, called a prayer here, is because God is the one who has brought me this mercy. And as I noted earlier, as we started, she praises God for all of his attributes, not just his um, mercy in granting her a son or his uh, grace in granting her a son but she sees God in his totality and in, in, in the, the the big picture of who he is there is no one holy uh, there is no rock like our God um, he turns the world upside down and reverses things that no one would think would ever be reversed she speaks glorious things of him. And reading them from verse 2 to verse 10, we could say, well, why is she saying all of that? Well, when you're, uh, as many years ago people would say, he was waxing eloquent. <laughs> uh, when you are poetically expressing the mightiness of God, it's hard to not cover everything. Then her prayer was hers. My heart 
my horn, my mouth, I. And some have looked at um, verse 3. This is going to kind of connect uh, together perhaps. But, but, but she says, I, I, I here at the beginning. And at the end in verse 10, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. She's elevating God's great justice and how he will execute and bring justice. She doesn't say in his time, but the very fact that she finishes with the description of him upholding his anointed and uh, giving strength to his king means that uh, there is a timetable perspective that it's all futuristic. It's all talking about the future, that, that God will continue to do that because God has always done that. He's going to take care of his own. And so this prayer for her is very personal because maybe in verse 3, her statement uh, boasts no more proudly, do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. Who's she talking to? I mean, it's possible that she could be really talking to Penaniah, that she um, is really in this personal aspect of the prayer saying, all of you, when you stand before God, look at me. God has reversed my, but don't you speak proudly. And I, and I think that that might reflect her humility because she could have been all sassy and gone back to Penaniah, put it in her face. And, and honestly, the Bible isn't, uh, the New Testament equally doesn't tell us everything about every day that happened in everyone's life. And, and so I'm not suggesting that Hannah didn't have a mean bone in her body because I don't know. I do know that what's recorded elevates her to have this enormous amount of faith. And then in her prayer, warning anyone who would be proud or anyone who would be arrogant to, to stop it when you look in comparison to God. So if she had been sassy back to Penina because, look, God got me, brought me this child, um, and I'm willing to sacrifice him for God. Uh, she, if she had done that, that's very counter to what she says in her own song, verse 3. So, but anyways, is this aimed at Penina? Perhaps. Um, but it would be aimed at anyone who believes that God is not going to reverse things. God, God's not going to do that. God's not going to do that. Well... Hannah believed he was. Hannah believed when she went to pray, give me a son. She believed it. When Eli told her, what you have prayed about will happen to you, she believed it. And then she and her husband had relations, believing, she believing, perhaps him, but certainly her, that what God promised he certainly would deliver. And it will be the attribute of Mary that will be said, blessed is the one who believes in this fulfillment of the word spoken to her. And this will be true also here of Hannah. And she says, I, I believe this. And all of you who are proud, all of you are arrogant, you just need to close your mouths and bow your heads because God is the one who is great. And that's, that's just really magnanimous of her. Another thing about this personal aspect of her prayer is that she overlooks the gift and praises just the giver. And, and I refer, uh, referred to this in the introduction, but I want to emphasize it again. That, you know, we sing the songs, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and and certainly when we're teaching children and teaching us adults to be more mindful in articulating the things for which we can really count as great, great, uh, great blessings to us. Um, it's not like saying, you know, Lord, thank you for my car because it drives so nicely and I look so nice in it and, <laughs> and it, and it, the stereo system is so nice and the air conditioning is so nice. It's, um, she doesn't praise the gift. My son is so wonderful. He's so beautiful. Uh, he's so um, 
like his father. He's <clears throat> don't misunderstand. I, I want a car with air conditioning and I want it to drive nice. And there's nothing wrong with articulating the things for which we love about whatever gift it is, even your children. But she praises the giver. And to me, that's just a reflection of what she says in verse 3. Those of you who are proud, boast no more. Those of you who are arrogant, just close your mouths. That, that she knows it's all about the giver. And so God is... God has no peer in Hannah's eyes. There is no God like him. Um, not only could you say that he's unprecedented, he's unparalleled, and it's just simply because he is the only God. And then notice here in this last thought is, prayer must have been her, her solace. When you, when you notice this song, she just bursts with this God of, of uh, amazing reversals. Uh, the, the, the Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He raises the poor from the dust to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. I mean, we could try to say that, well, that's talking about Jesus when Jesus is going to raise us to, to great heights in, in Ephesians 2. And there's no question that that's what Jesus does. But I think that what she is saying is that she has witnessed in her own life providentially how God works. So this song tells us she's been watching her life through the prism of glasses to see God. That's why she went and prayed, Lord, give me a boy. That God was part of her life and prayer must have been part of her life because prayer was her solace. It was her joy. It must have been her triumph because she, she prayed for the boy Eli told her she was going to have the boy, then she had the boy, and then she took the boy back to Eli, and she watched her boy grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Um, on her deathbed, there could probably not have been a more happy mother and content mother, because prayer was her solace, and God had brought her that wonderful blessing. Sorry, sorry about that. Old wimpy Don. <laughs> anyway, so after we see this personal aspect of the prayer and, and we see how prayer was her solace, this song shows us that was a prayer to be sung. It's okay to pray a three-word three prayer, a, a ten-word prayer, a uh, two minute prayer a five minute prayer it's the longevity of it has no bearing on its fruitfulness but the marvelous thing about what this prayer shows in its expression is how meaningful that communication to God was for Hannah and we'll see it in Mary we would even see it in Elizabeth who all became pregnant in providential and merry in miraculous ways. All three of them, in a very real sense, dedicated their sons to the service of God. But their songs came, their prayers came in thanksgiving because God had answered their request. So you, when you pray, believe. And in believing that God would answer your prayer. And when he does, give him thanks. Write a song. Make it poetic. Make it simple. But make sure that 
the flamboyant flamboyance of the words you choose to use are to make God what it's all about don't let it be about the gift let it be about the giver thanks so much and I hope that this has encouraged you may God bless you where you are and join us again next Sunday for more songs outside the Psalter. Yeah.